These are the answers to the chapter 12 packet, Solids and Modern Materials. Section 12.1, Classification of Solids. So we're gonna take a look at metallic solids first. And we see on page 464 that metallic solids are held together by a delocalized sea of collectively shared valence electrons. This form of bonding allows metals to conduct electricity. It is also responsible for the fact that most metals are relatively strong without being brittle. So we've answered parts A and B on the packet. Metals are held together by this delocalized sea of collectively shared valence electrons. They can conduct electricity and they are strong without being brittle. Now we're gonna talk about ionic solids. So we go back to page 464 and it says that ionic solids are held together by the mutual attraction between cations and anions. Letter D asks, can an ionic substance in the solid phase be a good conductor of electricity? So to answer this question, let's go way back to chapter four. This is on page 117 in your textbook. And let's take a look at figure 4.2. We see that sucrose dissolved in water is a non-electrolyte, whereas sodium chloride dissolved in water does conduct electricity. So you might think, okay, sodium chloride is an electrolyte but we're talking about solid sodium chloride. So not sodium chloride dissolved in water, just crystals of sodium chloride in the solid phase. This information is based on the AP Chemistry course and exam description. This is one part of it. And this is essential knowledge that students should have about ionic solids. Students should know that ionic solids have high melting points, they are brittle, and they conduct electricity, but only when molten or in solution. So ionic solids do not conduct electricity because the ions are locked in that crystal lattice and they are not free to move around. When ionic solids are melted or dissolved in water, the ions become free to move and therefore they will conduct electricity. So the answer to letter D is no. And the reason why in letter E is because in order for a substance to conduct electricity, there must be a flow of ions or charged particles. The reason why metals are good conductors is because the loosely held electrons are flowing throughout the metal. But in an ionic solid, the ions are locked in the crystal lattice and are not free to move around. Letter F, in order for an ionic substance to behave as a good conductor of electricity, it must be either molten or dissolved in water. So now we turn to covalent network solids. Again, back on page 464. Covalent network solids are held together by an extended network of covalent bonds. This type of bonding can result in materials that are extremely hard, like diamond. So we have answered letter G, an extended network of covalent bonds, and letter H, they are extremely hard, for example, diamond. All right, molecular solids. Molecular solids are held together by the intermolecular forces that we studied in chapter 11, dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonds. Because these forces are relatively weak, molecular solids tend to have low melting points, and they are soft. So here are the answers to parts I and J, the three types of IMFs that you learned in chapter 11, and molecular solids tend to be soft and have relatively low melting points. So two examples of each type of solid. For metallic solids, you might choose copper and iron as examples, but any metals would be good examples. For ionic solids, something like sodium chloride or magnesium oxide. For covalent network solids, we have examples of diamond or graphite, which is essentially carbon or silicon. And there's other examples like quartz, which is silicon oxide. And molecular solids, these are going to be things like covalent compounds, so hydrogen bromide or water, for example. So those are listed there. 
And now on to section 12.2, structures of solids. Crystalline solids are solids in which atoms are arranged in an orderly repeating pattern. And you can see this on page 465. Examples of crystalline solids include sodium chloride, quartz, and diamond. On the other hand, amorphous solids lack the order found in crystalline solids. Familiar amorphous solids include rubber or glass or obsidian. Okay, so we've answered the questions A through D in section 12.2. And now on to the next part. It says, note, information regarding specific types of crystal structures, unit cells, and crystal lattices. This information is not included in the AP chemistry curriculum, so we're going to skip the sections on pages 465 through 467 entitled Unit Cells and Crystal Lattices and Filling the Unit Cell. All right, section 12.3, metallic solids. Metallic bonding results from the fact that electrons are delocalized. Again, this is on page 468 and 469. A clean metal surface has a characteristic luster, which means it's shiny, and they are good conductors of both heat and electricity. It says that most metals are malleable, which means they can be hammered into thin sheets, and ductile, which means they can be drawn into wires. So here we have the answers to parts A through E in section 12.3. And it says that we can skip the sections on pages 469 to 472 entitled the structures of metallic solids and close packing. All right, part F, a material that contains more than one element and has the characteristic properties of a metal, that's an alloy. And in figure 1215, you can see that on the left, we have an alloy of gold and silver. And notice that the radii or the sizes of gold and silver are about the same. Then we have on the right, an alloy of iron and carbon. And you can see that the carbon atoms are much smaller than the atoms of iron. So the alloy on the left, which contains two different metals that are about the same size, is called a substitutional alloy. And the alloy on the right, which contains one atom that's much smaller and kind of fits in between the spaces of another atom that's larger, that's called an interstitial alloy. So answering letter G, a substitutional alloy can be formed in which the atoms of the solute occupy positions that are normally occupied by the solvent. So in the case of silver and gold or copper and zinc, one element is substituting for another, but they're about the same size, the same radii. But if the solute atoms are much smaller in size than the solvent, then interstitial alloys can be formed. The smaller atoms fill in the spaces between the larger atoms. Now, what does that do to the properties of that particular alloy? Well, it makes the lattice harder, stronger, and less malleable and less ductile. One example is steel, which is an alloy of iron and carbon. And we're not gonna look at the heterogeneous alloys or the intermetallic compounds on page 475. All right, section 12.4, metallic bonding. So suppose that we follow the eight minus N rule in which N represents the number of valence electrons. How many bonds would argon normally form with its neighboring atoms? Well, eight minus eight is zero. Now for chlorine, that would be eight minus seven, and you'd be not too surprised to learn that chlorine forms exactly one bond with its neighboring atoms to make molecules of diatomic Cl2. Sulfur forms these chains or rings of sulfur atoms, and eight minus six is two, so each sulfur has two bonds to its neighbors. For phosphorus, eight minus five is three, and this P4 molecule 
has each phosphorus atom forming three bonds with its neighbors. The pattern continues with silicon, 8 minus 4 is 4. And now you might wonder, for aluminum, that would be 8 minus 3. Does aluminum actually form five bonds with its neighbors? And the answer is no. Explain how aluminum's valence electrons are involved in the structure of aluminum metal. Remember, we talked about metallic bonding earlier, and we said that metals have these loosely held, delocalized valence electrons. So metals don't have enough valence electrons to satisfy their bonding requirements by forming localized electron pair bonds. Instead, the valence electrons are collectively shared between several adjacent atoms packed closely together in a crystal lattice. So we're going to draw a picture similar to figure 12.21 and discuss the details of the electron C model of metallic bonding. So here is figure 12.21. You can see individual circles with positive charges. That's the metal ion. That's the nucleus and the core electrons. So there's a positive charge, but all of the valence electrons are loosely held in this C surrounding each of the metal atoms, the cations. So as you can see, the electrons are confined to the metal by electrostatic attractions to the cations, and they are uniformly distributed throughout the structure. The electrons are mobile, so therefore it explains why metals are good conductors of electricity, because the electrons can flow throughout, and they're also good conductors of heat. So these mobile electrons can move in response to temperature gradients and can permit the transfer of kinetic energy throughout the solid. Metals are malleable and ductile. This can be explained because the metal atoms can form bonds to many of the neighbors and just slightly change their position and that reshapes the metal. So that explains what's going on in terms of electrical conductivity, malleability and ductility, and we're going to skip the section entitled Molecular Orbital Model. Section 12.5, Ionic Solids. So it should not be a surprise to you that ionic solids tend to have very high melting and boiling points. So why is that? Because ionic bonds are very strong. You have electrostatic attractions between positive and negative ions in this very extended lattice, this crystal lattice, so very strong ionic bonds. Why are ionic solids brittle? Refer to figure 12.25. So here we have a network of positive and negative ions. A stress is applied to the ionic crystal and what that does is that stress causes the atoms to slide and when they do slide, now you have negative ions lined up on top of negative ions and positive on top of positive. That creates repulsion and that separates the layers. So that's why ionic solids are brittle and sort of flake apart or can be cleaved along well-defined planes. We're going to skip the section on pages 482 to 485 entitled Structures of Ionic Solids. Section 12.6, molecular solids. You know that they are held together by dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, or hydrogen bonding. They are soft and have low melting points because unlike ionic solids, intermolecular attractive forces are relatively weak. Sucrose does have a rather high melting point for a molecular solid, but that's because there are lots of opportunities for hydrogen bonding to occur. Each sucrose molecule has eight OH groups, which allow for the formation of multiple hydrogen bonds. Section 12.7, covalent network solids. Well, you can imagine that if you're held together by covalent bonds, and covalent bonds are very strong, Covalent network solids are much harder and have higher melting points than molecular solids. So covalent bonds are very strong. Besides diamond and graphite, other examples include silicon, germanium, 
quartz, which contains silicon and oxygen, silicon carbide, and boron nitride. All of these are extended networks of covalent bonds. It says that graphite is a soft substance that's used as a lubricant and in pencils. However, diamond is a very hard substance that can be used for saw blades and cutting tools. And yet they're both examples of covalent network solids. So how are they different? It has to do with the layers. In graphite, you have these layers that are held together by intermolecular forces. Whereas in diamond, each carbon atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms, and that's very strong in all directions. So diamonds are very hard, but the weak intermolecular forces between the layers in graphite allows those layers to slide past each other and flake over each other easily. So when you drag your pencil across a piece of paper, flakes of graphite are being removed and deposited on the paper. So delocalized electrons extend over the layers. Electrons move freely through the delocalized orbitals. Graphite is a good electrical conductor and a good lubricant and gives graphite kind of a greasy feel. All right, the element silicon or germanium would be a covalent network solid and also a semiconductor. Let's talk about semiconductors, the process of adding controlled amounts of impurity atoms to a material is known as doping. Let's talk about different ways in which we can enhance the conductivity of semiconductors. Semiconductor doping is discussed on pages 489 and 490. Phosphorus is one of the things you could substitute and phosphorus has five valence electrons, but silicon has only four. So the extra electrons create what's called an N-type semiconductor. N signifying that the number of negatively charged electrons has increased. On the other hand, if you substitute aluminum for silicon, aluminum has only three valence electrons compared to silicon's four. So instead of having extra electrons, there are electron vacancies known as holes, and therefore the negatively charged electron is not there. The hole can be thought of as having a positive charge. So instead of an N-type semiconductor, you can have a P-type semiconductor where the P represents positive holes in the material. So letter F, when Phosphorus is substituted for silicon in the doping of a semiconductor. We create extra negative charges, so an N-type semiconductor because of the extra electrons. Whereas with aluminum, there are fewer electrons and you create these positive holes. So a P-type semiconductor has a lack of electrons or extra positive charges. And we're not going to discuss sections 12.8 and 12.9, so that represents the end of the chapter 12 packet. I hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.